Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it's time for the Q&A, so let's go ahead and knock this out. All right, first question. Your opinion on knee sleeves. Uh, well, my opinion on knee sleeves is going to be like any other device that uh, we utilize for the purpose of lifting more weight uh, with an external object. Now, a lot of people are going to be like, well, what do you mean? Well, that's what knee sleeves are for. We use knee sleeves to lift, you know, like 10 more pounds on a squat. They allow you to compress energy and store it behind your knee to help spring you out of the bottom. Uh, people need to remember that knee sleeves don't prevent injuries. All this nonsense about things like keeping joints warm and all of that, that's, that's BS. There's no actual reason to believe any of that. Uh, other than maybe they might cut a little circulation off so things might feel a little number if you get really tight ones. But, but ultimately, sleeves really kind of exist for the purpose of allowing you to lift more weight. And not because your muscles are lifting more weight, unlike a belt, uh, which improves neuromuscular efficiency. Uh, knee sleeves, uh, again, they do it through external mechanical tension. So you have something besides muscles lifting weight. So what I would say, uh, if your federation allows knee sleeves, right? If your federation allows knee sleeves in whatever strength sport you compete in, then you should probably get a pair. Meaning, if you're at a point to where you could lose a meet or be five pounds away from a record of some type or, or be a really close call, practicing in sleeves, using sleeves, training in sleeves, and go ahead and competing in sleeves would be worthwhile for you. But uh, what would I say to someone who doesn't compete in any strength sport? I, I wouldn't recommend sleeves at all. There's no point. There's no benefit. They don't help you gain more muscle. They don't help you gain more strength. They don't lower injury risks. They're just extra work to take on and off. They cost money and they don't really do much of anything um, other than maybe create some placebo in theory for some people. But uh, if you're not going to compete in something that allows a sleeve, I just I don't recommend it. But if they're going to allow you to win some sort of competition by giving you five or ten more pounds on a squat, all right, or allow you to break a record, then by all means, you should absolutely have a couple pairs training them to compete in them. All right, next question. Do you think it's okay to replace conventional deadlift with trap bar deadlift in your training? Uh, well, your training is a very specific thing, isn't it? By your, do you mean my training? Probably not. Probably not. Uh, could I substitute them out on occasion? Sure. Do I have a trap bar? Yes. Do I think for a lot of athletes out there, particularly certain field athletes, a trap bar is an absolutely viable replacement? Yeah, I think so. I think particularly for field athletes who are overly concerned with lower back fatigue, um, I think trap bar deadlifts are actually a pretty fantastic exercise. I mean, they absolutely have their place in strength and conditioning. However, what I will state with that is that as a direct replacement in all programs, no, no. I mean, obviously, if you're going to power lift, no. But even if we come down to the, the question of things like maximum recoverable volume, axial loading, things like that, you can lift more weight with a trap bar. Right? You can lift more weight with a trap bar due to better leverage advantages. Right, It can put certain things at a more favorable leverage. Changes moment arms. Well, that's well and good if it's just due to muscles being stronger and lifting more weight, but that's not always the case. In the case of the trap bar, it's not just that you can lift more weight, it's that you have to lift more weight to get the same training effect. Well, if you have to lift more weight to get the same training effect, just keep in mind that that can take its toll in terms of recovery on the back end of it. Um, so to say that can you just replace them by default? Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. Uh, but in many cases, can they be a viable replacement? Yes. And are trap bar deadlifts, both low handle and high handle, are they proven in strength and conditioning for a wide variety of athletes to get stronger? Yeah. Yeah, I think they are. Uh, they're a valuable tool just like it with anything else, but uh, they're not necessarily a replacement on all levels for a conventional deadlift, right? They're not always a replacement. Uh, they might be for certain types of field athletes who just need a hip hinge exercise, who are overly concerned with lower back fatigue, who might not do very large volumes of deadlifting. Uh, I would say that that's absolutely a viable replacement. Are they a replacement from time to time when you want to substitute out the conventional deadlift for a different movement pattern for just a little while that's similar with good carryover? Yeah, I think they can be there also. So it's really a context-specific question. All right, next question. Hi, Jason. Long-time follower here. 
Right now, due to previous injuries, I'm squatting and deadlifting the same weight that I'm bench pressing on a 5x5 novice program. How do you recommend that I rebuild those lower body lifts now that I'm injury free? Uh, should I use accessories? Thanks, coach. Uh, well, it depends on what caused your injuries. Did your injuries get caused by actually squatting and deadlifting? Well, if that's the case, then yeah, you're going to need better fatigue management. You need to address maybe what happened with your form. Start looking at your overall fatigue, looking at your programming and figure out, did you push yourself too hard? Did you get overuse injuries as a result of these exercises? In which case, yeah, you're going to need better fatigue management, in which case you might need more accessory movements uh, to reduce injury rates. All right, that's things that you have to think about. You absolutely have to think about. Uh, was this an injury caused from something outside of your training? Right? Was this something external that affected your back or one of your legs or your hip or something like that? Uh, that is causing you to have to come back and rebuild, in which case, no, you just run a straight linear program. If it's an external injury that caused it, let's go back to the point. Just run the straight linear program, run it as is, and just build up. It'll come pretty quick. So again, another one of these context specific questions. So I guess it's gonna depend on what the answer is. But I will say though, that if you are having an injury that might be related to, to overuse of a movement pattern, then it is time to address fatigue management. It might be time to address technique, but usually more fatigue management. And it might be time to address uh, exercise variations, assistance and accessory movements to get the workload in to strengthen up those areas that might have been injured as a result of the overuse and to allow it to recover a little better. So it really, it really is going to depend on, on what the cause of your injury was, right? Uh, all right, next question. Hey Jason, why do you think the press is such a neglected lift? I've been going to the same gym consistently for two years or so and maybe a handful of people are performing it. Uh, it's a neglected lift for a lot of reasons. Honestly, it used to be a traditional lift. It's just that it's become tradition to neglect it. Uh, because again, the bodybuilding world and bro bodybuilding has largely taken over gyms, which means you don't think about things like, how can I get big and strong? How can I train most of my body? They're like, how can I isolate everything? And, and so if you're looking at things from the whole bodybuilding perspective, why would you ever do a really big movement when you could just do three isolation movements to replace everything? Right, they're always trying to isolate stuff. Well, if you sit, you can isolate your shoulders better. You know, this bodybuilder thing. I think that's a big part of it. I think that's a big part of it. Uh, number two, it's hard. The press is a hard lift to perform. It's a hard lift to progress on. Uh, it's just tough. It's a lot of work. It's difficult. And it's difficult to progress on. You stall really easy on it. It's fatiguing. You know, just like deadlifts, right? But I would go out on a limb and say more people actually <laughs> deadlift these days uh, than people who perform the press. Um, there's also the fact that, again, a lot of bodybuilding gurus have more or less stated that they feel it's redundant, that they feel that it's useless because you can just do other exercises to replace anything it can do. And maybe you just don't want to press a weight overhead. It could hurt your shoulders, right? So you have all these different reasons for it. And, and I think it's a whole combination of those reasons as to why it's fallen out of disuse. Um, I don't think you can pin it down to just any one of those. It's going to be a wide variety, but there's a lot of us who are trying to bring it back. Uh, I'm one of them. There's other guys on YouTube who are. There's coaches and stuff who are. So we need to make that happen. All right, next question. Jason, what do you think of a well-formulated ketogenic diet for strength athletes such as ourselves while in a calorie surplus or a lean bulking uh, phase of training? I've seen the research on endurance athletes done by Dr. Jeff Follett, but I haven't seen any research on athletes like us. I would like to know uh, what you would expect hypertrophy and strength outcomes to be. You know, I'm going to almost contradict myself because, you know, I made a video a while back and actually that video came out a couple weeks after I made it. Uh, discussing, I don't know, it's probably kind of silly to try to really try to formulate a ketogenic diet for gaining muscle, right? That's what I said. Truth is, though, I don't know that it really is because at the end of the day, when I go back and look at my own anecdote of, I was at the biggest and strongest I've ever been in my life and on a keto diet years and years ago, um, I've been rebuilding muscle and strength while on a straight keto diet with no carb ups. And that's always been my thing. I'm, oh, you got to type all these carbs and everything else. But I'm starting to realize you really don't. And you look at all this data by Dr. Volek, you don't even need to consume dietary carbs to replenish muscle glycogen. Now, I'm not trying to be anti-carb by saying that. 
Uh, I'm not even being anti-carb with me choosing to do a ketogenic diet. I think carbs are great. I think carbs can be fantastic. I think carbs absolutely have their place in athletics. I just don't think they're necessary. And I think that there can be some valid reasons for some people to want to do ketogenic diets regarding diet adherence, energy, inflammation, uh, personal preference, right? And at the end of the day, here's what I'm going to say. If you are getting sufficient protein, and I don't mean just the protein grams, I mean bioavailability, you are getting sufficient calories and you're getting sufficient micronutrients, I think any diet is capable of maximizing muscle growth. And what I do know is that if I know I've got muscle memory happening, I feel like I've been regaining muscle quite effectively uh, without really even a caloric surplus on a straight keto diet these days. And I know other athletes who do. Anecdotally speaking, I know plenty of strength athletes who do just fine. And it's not just, just fine. Some of them are at the world level and the ultra elite level. So it's not like they're, they're just a couple of them and they're in the middle of the field either. Um, so you know what? I'm going to go back and say that I think any diet with sufficient protein, sufficient calories and sufficient micronutrients is capable of maximizing size and strength, ketogenic or otherwise. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.